Good morning. Um, my name is Ipatios Moisiadis. I'm the Business Development Director and UK Country Manager for Green Solver. Thank you for taking the time uh, to join us uh, this morning on this, uh, on this uh, webinar. Uh, what we will try to do is uh, give you a snapshot of um, the, uh, the current situation as we, as we read it and also uh, provide you uh, the, the risks and opportunities that we see uh, moving forward, especially uh, in, the, in the solar and the wind markets. Um, so uh, we will, uh, just, just to make you aware of the logistics, uh, everyone who is participating as an attendee uh, in this uh, Zoom uh, webinar cannot talk, uh, but you can uh, communicate with us either through the chat or put the uh, questions uh, through your through the Q&A and then at the end we will uh, we will answer those questions uh, if you can and if it's possible please allocate a if, if a if a question you have is uh, allocated to a specific slide or a specific uh, presenter if you can put the name of the presenter or the um, the slide number it will uh, it will help us uh, it will help us answer better uh, if we cannot answer any of your questions or we don't have the time, then uh, we will follow up and uh, uh, provide uh, our insights uh, following the webinar. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, my colleagues. Uh, we haven't seen each other for a while. Uh, Guy, Agnes, Kat, thank you very much uh, for participating this morning. Uh, and uh, straight away, uh, you will allow me for a very short presentation uh, a couple of slides on, on Green Solver just to introduce ourselves. So I will share my uh, I will share my screen with you, um, and straight away we will dive into the uh, into the presentation. In this webinar, we will try to um, we will try to address, as I said, the the COVID nineteen situation, and hence the title of the webinar is an opportunities arising from an unusual situation. And it is an unusual situation. I think it's the first time in world history that we had the simultaneously shutdown of the uh, production lines in, in most, uh, uh, let's say, uh, countries in the world. And it's an unprecedented uh, situation that we're facing. Um, a lot of people are comparing things with the Spanish flu back in uh, 1918, but obviously we will lose, uh, we, we will live in a completely different world um, uh, in terms of uh, transportation, communication, trade, and so on and so forth. So this creates risks and opportunities um, uh, for, for everyone. And for us um, in Green Solver, we are true in our uh, values and our goals, and we are here to create financial environmental value. And if you would like, enable our clients to, um, to deploy more clean energy and uh, optimize what they have, uh, and uh, not only on the, on the generation side, but also to increase the, uh, the performance of the invested capital. We are at the moment uh, based in, uh, uh, in six different uh, locations around Europe with six offices. Our uh, latest uh, edition was uh, our office in Athens. We operate in uh, nine different countries. Uh, we have about 45 people in, in the team. Um, we have four quality standards, uh, including ISO 14001, 9001, 18000, 55000. 55, uh, currently, we operate about 1.4 uh, gigaw um, uh, gigawatts of solar and wind uh, assets. Um, but we have, as consultants and advisors, we have done more than uh, 17.6 gigawatts um, uh, of, of projects. And also, we have constructed around 1.6, 1.7 now um, uh, gigawatts of, of projects, mainly in the wind sector, but also in the latest, uh, in the late, in the late uh, couple of years, uh, also in solar. Since February uh, this year, we uh, we are part of the Voltalia Group, uh, but uh, we remain pretty much independent. Uh, we remain uh, as a, an independent uh, uh, company within within the group. Uh, and uh, we retain uh, all the information from, from our clients and from the projects we work on separately from, uh, uh, from the rest of the group. And that's why we've retained the brand and uh, we don't have any significant change uh, in the team. Uh, but also this has given us access to markets that we were not present before. So uh, we are capitalizing uh, this opportunity uh, the best we can. 
This is a very uh, quick reference uh, snapshot of uh, projects we've, uh, we've realized uh, around, uh, around the globe. Uh, so mainly with presence in Europe, but with, with uh, global experience, um, both in, uh, in wind and solar. And of course, uh, now uh, over the last uh, year or so, we've, uh, we've expanded into energy storage, especially in batteries. Uh, mostly with uh, bigger corporations uh, or uh, utility scale projects or even municipalities. So uh, just to give you a bit of an overview on the topics uh, that we're going to see today, um, after the, the, the quick introduction, I'm going to dive into the um, uh, correlation between electricity prices and share prices of listed funds. Um, so we've picked uh, uh, 19 listed funds uh, from the UK and we're giving you a snapshot of the UK um, uh, and we try to make some, if you would like, connections between events that happened uh, over the last couple of months and uh, compare that to the electricity prices and the share prices. Then uh, Guy is going to give you a bit more on the risk and opportunities as we see it, as we see them. Uh, for now and for the foreseeable future. Um, Kat will give you uh, some insight on the construction and also on how you can, uh, how you can, uh, um, uh, what is happening with Forum Assure. Uh, and lately, um, uh, Agnes will, uh, will discuss about uh, the delays and implications on, on projects and auctions, especially in the French market the Irish market and the Greek market. And we will finish uh, off the webinar with a 45 minute uh, um, with, um, with, uh, with a Q&A. Uh, hopefully we will uh, take no more than 45 to 60 minutes uh, to, uh, to conclude this. So electricity prices and share prices. So the purpose here was to see what was the actual, um, the actual impact that uh, COVID-19 had in our industry. So we've, we've looked at the market, we took some uh, publicly shared data with, uh, from the London Stock Exchange, we've used the uh, 19 listed uh, funds in the UK, and we've looked at uh, the prices between the 14th of February and the 22nd of April. Uh, and started relating these with both electricity prices, the average electricity prices of uh, wholesale power in the UK, as well as uh, facts or events that happened due to uh, COVID-19. So we were trying to see um, uh, what is the real impact. And I th we think that looking at the prices of listed funds uh, gives you a, a, an idea of whether the industry is impacted in at what level. So we've uh, we've used uh, these uh, 19, uh, um, 19 funds. You have here some of the uh, big names, especially in the UK, uh, renewable energy industry uh, companies and funds that uh, have also um, uh, transformed themselves into IPPs. Uh, Bluefield, Foresight, uh, Greencoat, Gresham, uh, Gresham House, uh, John Lang, Next Energy, uh, and, and so on and so forth, Trig. Um, so names, uh, household names, if I can call them uh, like this, that uh, you know, they've, been, uh, they've been in this uh, renewable uh, energy roller coaster from, uh, from the start. So I'm going to give you some graphs, and I'm going to you're going to see um, you're going to see where, where things are. Um, so this first graph is um, is average prices. So we've uh, took the prices between the 14th of February and the 22nd of, uh, of April, and uh, the bottom uh, the bottom here uh, the bottom line is the electricity prices, um, and we took the average. And you can see that in average, uh, we see, uh, especially um, after the um, uh, after the first confirmed death in the UK, where we had uh, a bit of a downward trend uh, since the beginning of February. I think mid February was the realization in Europe that uh, this is uh, this is serious and something is happening, and we need to start taking actions. And by uh, by March, we had uh, we had uh, confirmed deaths. Uh, in, in many European countries, and this had a direct impact into the shares. 
but if you move from March onwards to April, uh, and then this was a time that we had a lot of lockdowns, uh, we see that the, the share prices of these listed funds are pretty much stable. Um, and despite the fact that we have a downward trend in the electricity price, again, the electricity price remained the same. However, we will see perhaps a slightly different picture uh, moving on uh, because we will have a snapshot of each month. Um, and then this is a, another, uh, if you would like, way um, of, of uh, having exactly the same representation of the uh, average monthly prices. We've seen a bit of, uh, you know, dip, but in general, uh, uh, from March onwards, the, the prices remain pretty much, uh, pretty much the same. But here, uh, here you can see that uh, even when the whole thing started in, in February, we had a very kind of uh, graduate, uh, graduate dip. Uh, and this was uh, on the 28th of uh, February was the first uh, confirmed uh, British uh, uh, victim. But up until that point, again, we see all the share prices remain pretty much stable um, throughout, uh, throughout these days. However, in March, we see a slightly uh, different picture with more fluctuations. So on the 11th of uh, March, we have uh, the World Health Organization that declares uh, COVID-19 as a world pandemic, which was one significant event. And then a few days later, we had uh, President Trump issuing a travel ban to the US uh, from uh, mainland Europe, including the, including the UK. Uh, and here you start seeing that a lot of curves are reacting to this, uh, to this situation. And we, we continue to the downward trend until France has um, the lockdown imposed on the 17th uh, of, of March. Um, and then a few days later, we have the uh, UK uh, following, uh, following up with a, uh, with a total lockdown uh, and advising of uh, citizens to stay, to stay in. Uh, but moving on, once we've reached that point, again we see perhaps a bit of uh, uh, a bit of increase here, but also a steady state. And if you compare where we started and where, when, where, we, where we finished on the, uh, the end of uh, the end of March, overall we had a dip, but also we had a slight bounce back for the majority of the of the listed funds. And this is uh, perhaps a reflection of uh, two significant events, and you can see that uh, in the electricity prices at, at the bottom. Uh, the first significant event um, that reflected on the electricity prices more than anything else, the, the shares remain pretty much the same, was when the UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson uh, was uh, uh, treated into the intensive care unit, and um, a lot of people were worried. And also the, the downward price, um, the downward trend on price, and also here in the oil crash that we had on the 20th of, uh, of April. And if you see that for the previous 18 days as well, uh, throughout uh, April, the UK had the, the majority of its electricity being produced by renewables energy. So this price drop um, reflects two things. It reflects the, um, the drop of demand because uh, most of the production uh, and the industry was in uh, was in uh, lockdown, was uh, shut. Uh, but also the the fact that uh, the renewable energy was uh, dominating the energy mix uh, over this uh, past uh, few days. So uh, these two uh, facts, or this uh, these two, uh, if you would like, events, led to pretty much electricity prices on the 20th of March to be at three pounds per megawatt hour. Um, which was the lowest over the um, over the last uh, uh, over the subject period, if you would like, and um, uh, since then the market uh, has started uh, thinking out loud or at least discussing of where are we going and uh, how can we how can we correct the, the forecast models that we have done, and he will elaborate a bit more later on. On that point, and, and give you a bit of our insight on how we would, um, how we would see the forecasting models and the prices uh, change. So, if I can uh, give you five takeaways uh, from uh, from this point, 
Um, number one, the, the share prices remained pretty much steady. You had fluctuations, but the industry demonstrated um, a lot of resilience. Uh, you had uh, shares dropping as a response to specific events, uh, but then you had corrections, and, and, and overall the performance was, uh, was, uh, was steady over, this, uh, you know, over the period between the 14th of Feb and 22nd of April. Um, however, uh, despite being steady, we had a slight decrease. Uh, if you compare it with uh, the figures uh, before the uh, 14th of, uh, of Feb, um, and also uh, we see that uh, there is a potential downward trend um, that will remain a steady downward trend, both on the shares as well as on the electricity prices. Number three, the day-to-day -day price fluctuation remained high, especially in April. We went from uh, you know 26 uh, to three. Um, pounds per, per megawatt hour and back up again and down. So we had a lot of day-to-day -day fluctuations, um, which were not, um, were not uh, expected necessarily. But also, um, if you would like, as, as I've mentioned, the, the fall on demand and the high renewable uh, mix, uh, renewables mix into the power production led into, the, um, uh, into very low prices. Um, uh, especially at uh, towards the end of the subject period uh, on the 20th, 20th to the 22nd of, of April. However, we anticipate a, a bounce back, and again, Guy will expand to that. I think uh, actions like the Green Deal uh, will lead to, uh, to, to recovery and uh, renewables, uh, and as well as electrification of transportation, if you would like, and, uh, and uh, power shifting, especially with storage, uh, will be up there um, and will be supported uh, both from the EU as well as from the, let's say, Europe and North America and, and the rest of the world. I will stop there. Uh, Guy, I don't know if you can, uh, if you can uh, hear me. Um, <laughs> excellent. So uh, it would be extremely good if you could uh, take it on and I will share the, uh, will, we will answer your questions at the end on the Q&A section, uh, on the Q&A uh, section of this uh, of this webinar. So, Guy, um, yeah, take yeah. it take it on. Thank you. Um, so, on the operations, as as uh, as we said, I mean, we so we we're, we're, uh, the idea is just to give you a, a an update of what um, of uh, what we see. I mean, as uh, as Epatio said in the introduction, we manage about 1.6 gigawatts across nine countries of wind and solar. So, we do see a, a fair share of. Uh, of activities. Um, Patrick, if you can move to the next slide, please. Uh, the, uh, so we, we made it very simple in terms of what, 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 uh, uh, what we see. On the HSC side, we do see a risk uh, coming up now with the, uh, the new, uh, with the rules now being clarified. I think it's great. Uh, I think there was a lot of, uh, uh, people were very attentive in the March, uh, March beginning of April, a lot of construction sites were put on hold. Uh, a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of activities slowed down. Now we're all back, uh, especially on construction site, all back, uh, back in operations. But it does raise a concern for us in terms of uh, uh, making sure uh, COVID guidelines are are issued. They're uh, they're, they're published. That people know about them and that they are respected. Uh, and that obviously is is a greater concern in uh, in solar. Than, uh, than in wind. Uh, why? Because in solar, we tend, obviously, uh, from the uh, special maintenance, uh, even EPC side, it tends to be a chain of subcontracting, which is, a, which is a longer <laughs> than, uh, than, uh, than in wind. Um, so therefore, you know, there's always the risk of, like, as you're passing on the different uh, information that somewhere, you know, the information gets lost. Um, so we're being very attentive to that. Um, as you know, that, 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 that we feel can be, uh, can be a risk. Uh, on the supply, <clears throat> we don't see uh, much impact, to be honest with you. I mean, we, again, we, we're more worried on the wind than on the solar. Uh, we've seen delays, especially uh, where there, there's, um, 
more dependent on uh, Italy because Italy has been the, the hardest hit in terms of uh, industry. Uh, and that's true, uh, especially when you're talking electrical equipment, you know, there's a lot of factories out there. Um, but the, uh, so the, the delays have been extended. We wasted uh, only a few weeks on, uh, on some electrical supplies, but in the end, uh, things are pretty much in, uh, in order now. Uh, so we don't see much uh, much impacts there. Uh, on solar, um, obviously it depends more on the Asian uh, supply lines and there in terms of uh, stock levels and, and all. Again, a lot of uh, rumors at the beginning that there would be issues and all, but in the end, we, we uh, you know, the, in practice, we don't see much, uh, much, uh, much impact, um, which is good news. The EPC itself, uh, and there we're talking again, let's say EPC is construction of, a, of a, on the wind or EPC on solar. It's a medium risk, it's just because in the end, EPC has a combination of supply and, and people risk, you know. So we, uh, even though supply is, is low, the, the people in itself, you know, depending on how well the rules are respected, um, but it should, should not be an issue, but uh, together it, it, it might. Um, and especially when you start looking at the smaller, again, uh, smaller installations where people are, are closer together. But uh, um, yeah, so so far, you know, no no big issues there. No big issues on on the ONM. Um, the uh, on the wind, the ONM providers uh, a question, and some uh, turbine manufacturers, um, some OEMs had a strategy of uh, delaying uh, preventive, only uh, coming in into curative. That raised a lot of questions as to you know what will be the impact uh, uh, overall. Now again, we're back into a almost normal uh, situation where most of the uh, well, all of the uh, OEMs are basically uh, uh, adopting a more um, regular uh, maintenance uh, schedule. We've seen issues around spares, and we'll talk about spares a bit later. Um, and that 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 we think is an opportunity to more 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 than uh, more than the risk. And finally, uh, I need to mention the financing risk because uh, we've also seen um, a couple of instances where, obviously, in April, the, the liquidity premium uh, actually increased uh, double in, in some cases. So that puts some banks in, in trouble, especially when they actually sign a, um, a, a financing just before the COVID with the idea of to, uh, to, uh, to do a consortium. Uh, afterwards, uh, and basically when they went back to the market to, to refinance uh, the debt, uh, liquidity premiums were, were such that they, they had to refinance at, the, at a loss for them. Uh, we do see that as, as a risk. Um, we put it as medium because in the end, everybody's very attentive. No one, and I say no one in terms of the banks, do not, you know, are not really keen to, uh, to, to increase, uh, increase uh, margins per se but the risk is there and and it may be that we end up with um, you know higher margins overall uh, on, on financing which will then you know obviously affect the um, the whole uh, the overall economics of the of, uh, renewables projects um, but that risk is not I mean apart from the the issue I mentioned in the, in the in, in March you know on, on a couple of uh, financing that we've been aware of uh, right now you know, the, the financing that have closed in the recent weeks have done so uh, along the, the lines of the, uh, what we, we had pre-COVID. But the discussions we have with bankers is that, you know, that may change. So, you know, that, that's a point to be, to be attentive on. Um, Patios, yeah, thanks. The opportunities that, that, that we see, well, of course, uh, especially with service providers or maybe unfortunately for, for them, but you know, it, it is a time to think about your contracts and, uh, and that's more from a business standpoint. Um, you know, some, especially service providers will be uh, cash or are cash uh, worried <laughs> at minimum, if not cash strapped, uh, which is an opportunity to, to trade uh, either a scope for cash or uh, you know price for uh, price for cash and and re re renegotiate some uh, some of the terms and um, and, and, and you know, we, we feel you know that we should uh, we should do that um, so that's clearly one obviously the uh, the maintenance routines also I mean the what we did on the what we saw on the wind of like you know pushing bouts uh, some some uh, pushing out some uh, preventive uh, actually there's a lot of things uh, being done on, on the solar 
um, side of uh, you know doing maybe less preventive or adapting preventive to the type of uh, to the type of panels, type of inverters, and and they're doing all these things uh, uh, are now I think is the right time to um, to uh, yeah to analyze if you haven't done it yet, but then to experiment on these things, which is a way also to reducing the costs and at the same time uh, improving uh, improving margins. Um, storage. Uh, and we'll talk about that uh, a bit further, but uh, the, the storage is interesting. Now that's a more of a longer term uh, play, mid long term, depending on the age of your assets. But but I think the the volatility of the electricity uh, prices actually you know definitely highlights that you need to plan for for, for storage. So in the end, it means that within your sites, you need to have the land available. You need to have the grid capacity. We and, and it needs to be in in your plan to integrate the storage in your um, in your operations and, and basically what we see also is is on the onm and probably there the, the it's probably easier on the on, on solar but in that discussion needs to happen on the wind as well is, is the restructuring of your onm contracts if you move to the next slide uh patios what i mean by that is that you know we we've been pushing um for for years now the the uh, the, the notion that you know onm uh, as a as a full scope uh, approach is is not the right way to uh, to uh, to get the most value out of your asset. Why? Because an O and M an operations and maintenance contract is really about three things. It's about the monitoring of the asset, which takes uh, tools uh, analysis. It's auto all about automation and and software. Uh, people, which is all about skills and proximity. Uh, you need people to be close to the assets so they can react quickly and go there. And when they are, they need to be able to actually, uh, you know, know what to do and, and execute it. And spares, and spares is all about logistics uh, and working capital. You, you, need, you need to have, you know, the investments to to collect the, uh, to invest in the spares, and you need to be able to make sure they're there at the, at the, at the right time. And the combination of the three is is, you know, is is three different skills, which if you put them into a wrap, then you know it tends not. There's always a piece that that, that doesn't work. Um, so for us, you know, we 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 think that now is also an opportunity to try to split those those um, those parts. Uh, there are specialists who do only monitoring, who are you know uh, experts in in maintenance with, with people on the ground. Or who, who do only spares, and that's uh, and, and spares. When you look at it, especially if you look at wind spares, you know it's more than 50% of your win O and M costs. So it's something where you definitely need to uh, to, to again, you know, use that the, the 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 situation today where your assets are generating cash because they're uh, their um, electricity uh, ge uh, generating assets and where your, ser your service providers may not have cash you know, and therefore be more open for, for, uh, for discussions. Uh, and the alternatives are there. Uh, we, we, uh, we know them, we can you know, help you uh, set those up as well. Patrick, if you go to the next slide, one example is my wind parts, uh, so which is, uh, it is a Voltalia company as well, but uh, there are others as well, but my wind parts, you know, it's basically set up so you can offer, you know, supplies of the major spares of the, the basic stuff, the major components and consumables, but also, uh, you know, work on, on, on repairing on sometimes using uh, older components that we could uh, that we could repair and, and, you know, across a whole bunch of, uh, of, uh, of turbines. That's the mind shift that we need to, to get into with uh, uh, discussions with our um, our OEMs to, today because that 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 is where we uh, we see value in the uh, in the future. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Guy, for for the insightful uh, for the insightful uh, uh, presentation. And maybe uh, I'll, I'll ask I'll I'll answer because I see the question and I know, I know you said you would answer at the end, but I'll, I'll just be the, the renegotiation, of course. Uh, is is, uh, is when you are in a full scope uh, hard contract, fifteen years contract, is very difficult. Uh, there's no reason, but except the fact that you know these can, the, the turbine ma manufacturers need money, uh, and, and at the same point, so so now it's more of a, the, the cash is king, uh, and there is uh, you know we, they, we need to find room to to negotiate. Will it be a success? 
I don't guarantee, but that discussion can be open uh, and there's a lot more uh, appetite uh, for, for that. Anyway. No, no, please, uh, please uh, go ahead. Um, uh, Kat. Hello, everyone. Uh, next part is about construction and force majeure. When the pandemic started, there was a concern that uh, it will be classified as a force majeure event and it will allow contractors to be relieved from their contractual obligations. So it's really important to examine the clause itself. But just if you can, yeah. Um, so starting with the basic definition, uh, force majeure is an event or circumstance beyond the reasonable control of an affected party. So be it war or um, riots, um, acts of terrorism. Interesting bit is though that force majeure is not a standalone concept in the English law. So the first thing that uh, anyone would have to do is to see whether they have force majeure clause in their contract specifically, because if not, they will not be able to rely on that. Next one. Um, once we identify whether there is a force measure clause, we'll have to examine its language because those clauses vary greatly between contracts. They fall into two broad categories. So it will be one with the, an exhaustive list of events. So if there's anything that's not listed in the contract, you will not be able to claim it. But there will be some definitions with the, that are way broader, like the one that we had on the previous slide. Uh, they will often ha also have a non-exhaustive list. In either case, the first thing to do is to check whether a pandemic or a public health emergency is uh, on the list of events classified as a force majeure in your contract. If not, it's not it might not be the end of the story because there might be other events that's applicable in the situation. So for example, COVID-19 pandemic and governmental response affected transportation. So if shortages of supplies are one of the force measure events in your contract, you might be able to claim it. Uh, you might also want to have a look if you have a clause that says any event outside of reasonable control of the affected party or something to that effect, because pandemic could be classified as such. So once we know that there is a force measure clause in the contract and uh, we establish a force measure event, it's not enough to seek a relief. So it's important to note that the second bit is actually the hardest bit. Uh, the contractor, if, if, if we do have a force measure event, the contractor will have to show that the force measure event either prevented, delayed, or hindered their ability to deliver obli contractual obligations, and most importantly, that they took all reasonable steps to prevent it from happening. Um, that is an implied duty, so whether it's specified in the contract or not, it applies, and a really key issue here is that the financial hardship does not discharge from duties. So if all of a sudden delivery of services became way more expensive than you expected, that's not force majeure. That just, um, you know, that makes the event makes it uneconomical to deliver the contract, but you cannot claim force majeure if that's the situation. The next step is obviously to follow the process set up in the force majeure clause. Those processes vary again greatly between contracts, so it's really important to examine the language of the clause. In most instances, the process will begin with the affected party having to issue a notice that will be uh, a specified time frame given when the notice has to be issued, and uh, the contract will specify also what type of uh, relief can be sought. Most frequently, it will be a relief from non-performance, from liquidated damages, or um, they will be able to extend their contractual deadlines. As I mentioned before, the force measure is not, is not a standalone clause in, in, in the UK law, but uh, if you don't have the force measure clause in your contract and you're not able to deliver your contractual obligation due to unexpected event, and your, your um, contract is governed by the UK law, Doctrine of uh, what's called doctrine of frustration may apply. An unexpected event can be classified as a frustration if it was unforeseen and occurred after the contract was executed and makes the contract impossible or illegal to deliver or makes the obligation something radically different from what was originally agreed. This is not a doctrine that you have in, in a contract. This is something that would apply automatically if there's no force majeure doctrine, but its application is really narrow and again as it was in the case of force majeure if the event makes the delivery of services more expensive it would not discharge 
the contractor from their obligations. How the doctrine of frustration differs from force, force majeure is that it would cancel the contract altogether. So it would not uh, selectively discharge it from obligations. It would just uh, end the contract in, in itself. And uh, moving forward to other, so, so force majeure obviously was a, also was a great concern, particularly in the beginning. We haven't seen um, we haven't seen really uh, contractors issuing force majeure notices. I think it's uh, mostly as we can see it's not easy to prove that you've done all the reasonable, you've taken all the reasonable steps. As Keepa just were mentioning about the the, the construction site, well, he particularly mentioned the, with construction site closures. I think that we've seen a little bit less of it in the UK than it was in uh, the case in France. Uh, we can we could see manufacturing plants being closed, but none of it was on a mass scale. Uh, there were some plants closed across Europe and Asia, but it has not resulted in the mass shortages of key components for the renewable projects. Having said that, the pandemic and the governmental response has had a tremendous impact on, on, the, on the energy sector, and a lot of the projects will be uh, will be delayed. And the key factors affecting delivery of projects, I think, are logistical issues, obviously with the uh, with the movement restrictions uh, and uh, staffing issues in the transportation. There there might be delays in delivery of supplies to sites. Uh, there might be delays in licensing and permitting. Governmental agencies are basically um, focusing the, their attention on addressing the pandemic. And even if they have resources to issue permits, they might not be able to carry out assessments on sites to be able to issue those permits. We will also see grid delays. Uh, Ofgem advised DNOs uh, to focus on high priority services and they classified new connections as uh, lower priority services. So we might see some delays there. Um, currency exchange, um, obviously, with, uh, with the loss of procurements, that affects mostly um, projects in their procurement phases. Uh, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the key components are purchased in uh, in dollars, and um, and the, the drop in euro recently, and and, and strengthening of, of dollars might affect the the, the economics of projects. Um, we might see some staffing problems again. It is a pandemic; people will fall 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 ill, um, so they won't be able to. Uh, there, there might be some staffing problems uh, uh, over over the course of the year, really. Uh, and as we also have a potential for a second wave uh, of pandemic, that might uh, make some people think twice about starting pro construction projects. So it's not that much of a delay as a, as a potential to. Um, move projects a little bit farther into the year. Um, as, as, as we've heard uh, from Yipat, is also a drop in energy prices. Well, that, that's not expected to recover anytime soon. That changes economics of, the, of projects significantly, uh, particularly emergent projects. So you might see a delay in, 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 in those as well. Thank you very much, uh, Kat. Um, and uh, on to Agnes, who uh, who is going to give us the latest development with auctions in France, Ireland, and Greece, Agnes. Yes, good morning all. Uh, yes, so I'm just going to focus on these three countries. So let's start with Ireland. So um, in Ireland, there is one integrated single electricity market now. The government set up targets um, in terms of uh, renewable energies. So next target is for 2030, 70% renewable electricity by 2030, um, depending on the national energy and climate plan being drafted. The feed-in tariff scheme was closed in 2015. And so to um, reach the next target, uh, the government is uh, relying on uh, auctions and these auctions are held at frequent intervals and are designed in line with this uh, national energy and climate plan. So AirGrid um, is the uh, grid operator for part of Ireland because there is also the um, another operator in Northern Ireland, uh, but they work together in partnership. And so it's AirGrid uh, which is in charge with implementing and operating most of the auctions uh, processes for these auctions. Uh, so move on, moving on to the next slide, um, what we've seen is that for, uh, ne um, for the current auction, there has been um, a time extension. So the, the deadline 
has been postponed by almost a month. Um, so the closing date, which was set up for the start of this month, has been delayed to the end of this month. And so all the subsequent deadlines have also been postponed by a month or a month and a half. So the award date in the end, instead of being uh, mid-August, would be at the end of September this year. So this is for Ireland. So now moving on to Greece. Uh, in Greece, uh, there is one major interconnected zone and 28 islands, so a different situation there. Uh, in Greece also, the government set up targets in terms of uh, renewable energy sources in the energy mix of a country. Um, so there were 20, 20 targets. And uh, last year, uh, the country changed these targets, so plan for 2030, so increase the targets for 2030. So the targets for 2030 are 35% renewable energy sources share in energy consumption and 65% 60% sorry in electricity consumption. So this national energy and climate plan goes in hand with a new uh, renewable energy sources support scheme. RAE is Greece's uh, regulatory authority for energy. So what we've seen so far um, in terms of impacts of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic is that the, the successful bidders for last year auction they want a deadline extension for their project green collection. Uh, as, as we've seen before um, in this um, webinar, there are some delays uh, expected for to, to get some of the components for wind farms and uh, photovoltaic projects. And another impact is that uh, there will be some, well, likely um, slowdown in terms of uh, investments in the energy projects. And this is not only for Greece, but for most other countries. So moving on to the next slide. So for the latest uh, auction in Greece, so the government decided to keep the date, which was, so the auction was held on, this, on the 2nd of April, so at the start of this month. For this auction, the bids were capped at 61 euros per megawatt hour with a total volume of 600 megawatt. It, it was a mixed, uh, mixed auction. In terms of eligibility, the wind farms had to be at least 50 megawatts in size and for the photovoltaic projects at least 20 megawatts. What we saw is that there was a record low price of 49 euros per megawatt hour for a photovoltaic project and the highest uh, bidding price was about 55 euros per megawatt hour. So this is lower than what we saw for the last auction with an average price of 57 uh, euros per megawatt hour. And for this auction, um, so the majority of the winning projects were photovoltaic projects uh, for a total volume of 350 megawatts and 153 megawatts of wind farm projects were awarded. Because of the COVID-19 situation, um, it's expected there will be some grid connection delays due to the realization, new health and safety measures and so on. Uh, in terms of the next auctions in the renewable energy sector, um, same thing, there's, we expect to see some delays um, in the preparation for the auction and also for the next auction, which were planned for this summer, they, are, they will be postponed uh, to the end of the year. Thank you. So now moving on to the French market. Um, the main impacts that we've seen were uh, first on the construction works. So uh, construction works were stopped on site for a few weeks and now they have restarted with a new health and safety measures uh, as was discussed previously. Um, what also happened is that some PPA ways were posed on demand to EDF obligation, obligation d'achat. Um, so like this, the project owners did not have to lose contractual time and uh, the electricity price. A good thing also is that now electronic invoicing is possible, so it will help a lot uh, in terms of uh, all the administrative side. Uh, the calendar for the next auction has been modified. We'll see that just after. For the small PV projects uh, under 100 kilowatt peak, the March 2020 tariff has been extended for another three months and a major offshore wind turbine event, uh, so the floating offshore wind turbine uh, conference uh, in Marseille has been postponed to the third quarter of this year. 
during this crisis also, what we saw is that the Renewable Energy Association in France uh, submitted some propositions to the government. Um, so they asked, for example, for time extension for permit applications, uh, project completion, grid connection, because all these uh, different parts of a project are linked with uh, the obtention of a feed-in tariff of a contract for different tariff in France. So if you don't meet the deadline, you can't get these feed-in tariffs. Um, so that's why um, the French Renewable Energy Association asked for some time extension on that side. They also asked for a one-year extension on building permit validity and public inquiry process. And also they asked for uh, the possibility to have electronic public inquiries. Uh, so to avoid to have all the, the the person, a lot of person under the same roof, basically. And another thing is that we also ask um, the possibility to, for the successful bidders at the auction, uh, if they decide not to go forward with our project due to different issues linked with the COVID-19. Um, so if they could avoid, uh, well, if, um, yeah, they wouldn't be impacted by having um, their bank guarantee uh, used uh, in this case. So that was another request. So now let's have a look at the uh, calen uh, calendar for the renewable energy auction. Uh, so what happened is that the government decided to postpone uh, the deadlines by a couple of months. And for the ground solar PV and onshore wind, uh, two thirds of the volume has been further delayed by another three months So like this. Uh, bidders um, have more time to prepare their offers and the government also has more time to review the offers. So that's it for the French market. Thank Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Agnes. But uh, now everybody's asking uh, and, uh, what's, uh, what's, uh, what's then and uh, what, what will happen in, in the next day. So, uh, Guy, will you, will you give us a bit of light in, uh, in, in that respect? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, very uh, quickly as well, being conscious of time, I guess it's more, I guess for us, what, what, what we see, our conclusion is that we, we, we see, even though the, the world of uh, yesterday is probably, uh, you know, uh, has passed and, and tomorrow will, will be a different world. We, we see it as uh, still as a lot of, uh, lot of opportunities and probably very positive for, for, uh, for us who work in the, uh, sustainable development uh, field, put it like that. Uh, why? Because, you know, there's a call for action across Europe, even in Canada, uh, which is a CO2 emission country so, of, 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 of everybody, you know, being everybody being, you know, the citizens, the, the, the shareholders, the, uh, the, in, the industrials for, for more sustainability in, in everyday work. Uh, we've seen it, uh, you know, in Germany where, where the, the businesses, Asking the government to uh, to use the you know more to push more on green green actions, uh, we see an increase in the in the offshore wind in the the, the French uh, the, the the French PPE you know which is the, the annual plan. The Dutch are launching their auction on on offshore wind, so that nothing has stopped, and they keep keep going in in that direction. Uh, energy efficiency for industrials is uh, is becoming you know real. Uh, Real interest. If we see that in Spain, we see it in France. Uh, you know, the total shareholder meeting was interesting a few weeks ago, where they basically the uh, the shareholders ask, you know, again one of the largest uh, uh, polluters overall, but obviously you know strong on the pushing on renewables now, but to go even faster. And you know, all this creates opportunities. The Green Deal, uh, we see it as a, now as we see is being turned. There's a lot of discussions at the EU, which we're tracking closely to transfer that into uh, the way to get the economy back on its feet. If you go to the next slide, uh, we see it. I mean, obviously there's uh, Agora, which is obviously uh, energy minded, but you know, as as has made you know how to use 100 billion uh, effectively, you know, fast with with uh, fresh money making an impact uh, on the uh, on the economy overall, but at the same time, uh, uh, you know, helping us in Europe to, to attain uh, more sustainability. So that's investing obviously in renewables and smart grids and mobility and developing a hydrogen value chain. So all, all these things that we're actually uh, uh, 
a part of. So I think that's in the end, it's probably with the positive that will come out of a, of this uh, difficult crisis. Um, but then, you know, the key question there was one of the Q and A is the electricity. Uh, you know, what, one of the the implication, which is in the end, it's a good thing, is that the electricity prices are not going up. You know, and and uh, so I just had this is a, just an extract from the RTE. Uh, website, which is um, RT is the, the grid operator in France, uh, and I use France because we talked of UK uh, at the beginning. But if you see the year on year the same period uh, of prices in uh, in France of 33 euros uh, per um, uh, per kilowatt hour la last year and 24 euros now, so 30 percent drop uh, on average over that that, that period. I'm highlighting that for you. If you want to zoom further, you can see some countries are not, uh, it's not all uh, linear, but overall we do see, you know, a, a drop in the, in the electricity prices. And, and that is interesting because in the end, now you can say, okay, well, sure, it's one off and it's, does it, that what is, you know, it's not going to be there long term. But if you can move to the next slide, maybe uh, if I have it. Uh, yes, it's like, but uh, in the end, what, what we feel is that there, there's a, a very strong possibility now that uh, lower electricity prices can can uh, can be there uh, long term, you know? and and that obviously creates some complications, but also opportunities. The complications is for all these investors over the last let's say five six years who bought uh, assets wind or solar using you know the first twenty years, fifteen twenty years of tariffs as a as a uh, you know, as, as their base, but then putting in assumptions for the 20 to 30 uh, years over a 30-year business model, and, and using their you know electricity prices, which you know four or five years ago, and you know for those who followed us for a while, you know, I mean, we've been extremely vocal that we thought it was ridiculous, uh, uh, high in high prices. We we had assumptions over 100 euros per uh, uh, per per megawatt hour for for these uh, for these things. Now we're we're down to the uh, the 60 euros, but in the end, realistically, you can probably think, you know what, if now with this push towards more energy efficiency, more control of your, uh, uh, of the environment that, you know, there, there would be no reason why, why increasing prices would actually even go up, you know, so there's, that causes a real question for those who are sitting on these assets and where a lot of the expected return was made on these prices. Um, so you have to find new ways to, um, to, to make the returns. It will can have an impact on corporate BPAs where so when there's a big gap between the price of electricity and what you can negotiate, then it creates a space for corporate BPAs. If that gap reduces, well, you know, do, do you actually need to go BPA or can you just do an aggregation contract and it will be, be all better. And then basically also it will put pressure on the whole uh, uh, value chain. And that's probably fine, you know, overall, because in the end, opportunities, we said, you know, will be there for traders, aggregators, for storage, in storage, installation, storage management, management of your, of your, uh, of, of your electricity will, will become a key, a key element. And in the end, you know, I said cheaper, cheaper electricity is good for us. And so, uh, so I think we just need to adapt and not, and not complain. And on that note, uh, I think it's uh, time to see, I will stop sharing my screen. It's time to see uh, some of your questions. In the meantime, uh, you can even uh, uh, I can even give you access to your microphone and allow you to talk if you want to have your question uh, live. So you can wave your hand electronically. There's a little uh, hand that you can wave at me, and I will give you access. But if we can straight away jump into these uh, questions. Um, so Christine asked, uh, was uncertainty the cause of main impact when the Prime Minister got sick, or is there another explanation to this, uh, to this impact? I think uncertainty, uh, and whenever you have a, a and that's, that's a, a personal opinion more than anything, when, whenever you have any sort of, uh, uh, any sort of uh, uncertainty on, on uh, government or uh, even a company governance, and that creates a market uncertainty state that when you can see the reflection in the, the shares, you can see the reflection in the electricity, uh, in the electricity um, uh, prices. Uh, so uh, I don't know, Guy, if, if you have anything to add here. No, it's fine. Yeah. I hope we answer your, your, your question, uh, Christina. Um, um, on page 517, which basis can you negotiate close contracts? I think Yi, you've already uh, went through this uh, this question. Uh, is, is there anything else 
that you would like to add to this, uh, Agnes, perhaps, or someone else? No, I agree. I mean, it's, it's what I said. I mean, it's, it's, it's obviously, you know, you cannot renegotiate. It's easy to say, I'll go and re re renegotiate. It's not always that simple, but, you know, it's a rule of negotiation. You start by asking and, you know, and then you may get somewhere in the, in the, in the end. Also shows that whatever you're putting in now in terms of contracts, you need to build in the flexibility because th this is you know, it's just a start. Yeah. Indeed. And then um, we have uh, Antoine. If I'm uh, reading reading it correctly, uh, slide 26. You mentioned a drop in energy prices. Do you have forecast and electricity price uh, for UK or France? Um, I think it's 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 very hard for us. I mean, we're not uh, we're not uh, traders uh, to forecast uh, the electricity prices. I think we are here to interpret what we see um, and what kind of uh, you know uh, and comparing that with the operational side. We know the operational side extremely well. And then we can see the prices and compare the two and, and look at different events. If I can connect that, if you would like, with a uh, with a question we have regarding the high electricity prices, uh, uh, the high electricity production from RES um, while the uh, the oil price collapsed. I think um, we have we have higher electricity, uh, we have higher renewable energy mix. Within the within the electricity, uh, the overall uh, electricity mix in, in the UK, because um, uh, that's that's the way the contracts first of all are structured. So uh, whenever you have a contract in the UK, you have a hundred percent export. Whatever you export, the grid is is there to take it. Uh, but this creates a lot of um, uh, it creates a lot of uh, situations where you need to there's um, there's fluctuations on the uh, there's fluctuations in the grid. There's fluctuations with uh, with with power shifting, um, and also if you combine that with with oil with with the oil crash, that means that suddenly uh, the electricity prices come down because essentially it's much more uh, perhaps uh, economical, especially for fossil fuels that they are connected with uh, with with uh, with oil, like the, the natural gas facilities, perhaps um, to um, uh, to produce energy cheaper. So you have that kind of pressure high. It's it's a simple it's a simple sort of equation. You have you know a, a high supply which drives the prices down. It's a, it's down to demand and supply. Demand is 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 low because of COVID. You have high uh, supply because of uh, because of uh, the performance of uh, wind turbines and solar parks, and that drives the prices down. There, there, there's a question uh, from from Vincent uh, around the uh, the uh, with the uh, low price of electricity if corporate PPAs could be um, you know broken on the back of a force majeure uh, uh, issue. Um, so uh, it all depends on the contracts uh, in reality. But what what I've seen in corporate PPA contracts, I mean that that's exactly the the uh, the you know it's a point that uh, the the supplier is, is very wary about because of course when it's always a risk when you're dealing with a, a ppa contract is that price of electricity go below the, the price that you're there and therefore you know the guy who wants to buy it doesn't want to buy it anymore so so i, I uh, you know in the, the ones i've seen I haven't you know i don't think you will be able to actually do that um there is a, an issue in the in, in france there is the uh, the uh, price of electricity for alternative uh, electricity providers, the EDF, is selling at 42 euros to other, uh, alternative electricity providers, and obviously that price has come down. So all these alternatives are being stuck now with uh, having to buy at a higher price than what's on the market. So they're claiming EDF, but I mean even that, the, the analysis is that they, they they have very little chances of actually uh, winning. It's, it's that, that that's the game, and that's what you are, which is why on corporate PPAs. The approach is is always, you know, uh, to try to layer, you know, these, these these corporate PPAs so you can have different terms in term, well, different terms in terms of length and then in terms of pricing. So by having different layers and you hedge your risk uh, as a as a um, as a seller of electricity, but also the corporates, you know, for for uh, for them, that's then that's what they tend to do is to buy also at different prices, different lengths from different suppliers. I think we have one more for Christina. There is uncertainty whether, when economies restart, if the emissions will go up again in order for a faster ramp up, or if the path taken will be through renewables. 
have you seen any signs of which path might be taken? I think this is more of a political decision. What I can say uh, from a practical point of view is uh, we expect uh, we expect renewables and especially solar to do great in Europe and worldwide uh, because of uh, of uh, lower uh, dust particles and uh, you know and pollution in, in the air. So uh, this will increase the radiation. So we expect uh, if if the weather holds and like the weather we had in the previous two three weeks uh, with uh, sunny weather in especially in the UK we expect uh, fantastic results uh, for um, for the solar parks uh, this year um, and um, whether it's going to hold I think uh, yes there is always a push for the green deal and we need to deal we we see now right now COVID but also climate uh, climate mitigation actions is uh, as important as ever I think we we need to address the, the, the elephant in the room at some point that uh, we need to go down that route. And on a personal level, I would love to see that. But I think that in reality, uh, a lot of governments and uh, you know, economists will be, and businessmen will be preoccupied to bounce back financially. Um, so we know that renewables is going to be definitely a part of, uh, of this uh, kind of recovery uh, plan or the, the, the major recovery plan. But whether this will be... Uh, uh, drill down to the actual, uh, you know, to the action level, to the, to the, to the, if you like, to the tactical level or the operational level, and how soon this can be done, it's a question. Any more questions from anyone that uh, we can see? Um, how long do you think the sector can afford the current situation, uh, and any increase in capex due to logistics and construction delays? Uh, the two different questions. Um, I'll, maybe I'll take the CapEx uh, question. Uh, the other one is a bit of a crystal ball, to be honest with you. But an increase in CapEx, logistics, construction delays. Yeah, we, we, do, see, uh, we do see that in, in the construction uh, projects that we're in, uh, where we see uh, <laughs> the suppliers are, are trying to, to put in uh, extra costs. And, and it, it, they may be able to, in some cases, um, uh, so you know, it's part of the contingency. I'm, I'm using like on the logistics when they when they cannot uh, deliver because the government is not enabling them to go and uh, and use the uh, the auto routes or whatever for X Y reasons. Uh, well, not, not their fault, and and therefore there's a delay and it goes a bit a bit bigger. So we're not. Uh, it really is down to the contractual uh, details and and uh, yeah, it's not it's not a standard response. To be honest with you. Um, on the uh, on the question about the the sector and how can you sustain this, I think um, I, I think it provides the opportunity to, to to make a comment. There is there is a there is an angle that you can approach this, and you can compare the the renewables with the fossil fuel uh, sector. So um, I mean, if you were an investor now and you had to invest your money, where would you where would you put your bet? Um, and I think. Looking at the turmoil that you have in oil and gas, looking at the fact that perhaps in fossil fuels, you know, coal is out of the finance question. You cannot get any sort of financing for any uh, facilities in Europe, especially that uh, they um, they are coal related or lignite related. Uh, looking at the um, looking at the political turmoil, which brings the prices down. We had negative prices, uh, thirty four dollars per barrel uh, a few a few days ago. We had the oil crash, uh, the twentieth. Um, so it's, it's definitely, and if you see the share prices that we've, we've demonstrated, it demonstrates the resilience of the, of the, of the industry. So you might have a bit of a slowdown perhaps on further deployment, but if I could bet my money now, I would bet it in renewable energy. Mm. Um, and, and I think this is, this is a safe, in a sense, conclusion that you can have with, with the data that we have in our hands now. Mm. Yeah. And the way, the way it's turned, I mean, the, the question is like, how long can we afford well, I, I, which implies a bit of a negative, but honestly, I, I don't think we're we're in a negative uh, situation overall. I mean, it's yeah, it's it's it's, it's different. Uh, it's a, a bit more complex, maybe more difficult. Again, you know, it's more the service providers because the delays. You know, a lot of them may not have the cash you know needed to to delay stuff too long. But uh, the fundamentals. I mean, honestly, we we don't see that many the. You know, financings are being closed, transactions, you know, assets are being sold, uh, assets are being bought, production, you know, where the assets are generating uh, electricity. So, you know, they, and, the, and the fundamentals is that tomorrow 
that each every government wa wants to build uh, the future on on a on a uh, sustainable uh, way. You know, so uh, I think it's uh, in the end uh, it just uh, maybe even helps us uh, overall in the long term. And on that uh, positive uh, note, I think uh, being very aware of the time as well, um, I would like once more to thank everybody that uh, participated in this uh, webinar. Um, we will try to uh, give uh, the highlights of the webinar uh, as well. We will make it available through the, uh, through the website. But also I would like to thank everybody from Binsolver, Guy, uh, thank you for, uh, for, for leading this and for, for making this happen. And also to Agnes and Kat for... Uh, uh, for your participation and your uh, very uh, insightful uh, comments. Um, and uh, if anyone has any further questions or if you would like to come and uh, you know, to contact us, please do so either through social media or through the, uh, the website. We would, uh, we would love to, uh, to stay in contact and, and uh, continue the discussions and help wherever we can. So thank you very much, everyone.